I'd like to say something now before I read the, the reading. It's a great day today because it's St. George's Day. <laughs> and also we have got the, the marathon running. So many people running now for charities and everything, trying to raise money for as many, as many people as they can. And also we have got something going on down the town today, which will probably be the guides and scouts be marching in the town centre. So thank God now that all these things are taking place today. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 23, and it's in 1182. The Supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether throne or power or rulers or authority. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the, the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you have alienated you from God and were enemies of your, your mind because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in, the, holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusations. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to all creatures under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Invite Vicky to come up and speak to us. <laughs> Pray for Vicky before we start. Lord God, I just thank you for Vicky and her servant heart. I thank you she's here with us this morning. And I pray that the words she has are the words that truly come from you, Lord. That she has trusted in everything you've spoken to her. And these words are just for us this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you. <coughs> um, it's so great to be back. Um, it was weird at first when I came in, so I was like, I'm, I said goodbye to the church sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and about, I think it was about four or five weeks ago, Wendy emailed me and said to me, um, would you uh, like to come and talk at Christ Church? And I was like, yes, I'll be there. Don't you worry. Because um, <clears throat> I think that even though I've left the church and I'm not a, um, a member as such, um, I still feel that I can still come back and still preach and <clears throat> do where needs to be led and stuff. So, um, But I've got some exciting news, and, I, and I'm glad that it's only a small group, because then you can tell people. But um, I'm moving out of my mum's house. Yay! <laughs> um, <clears throat> in two weeks' time. So it's very, very soon. Um, and uh, I guess this weekend was prep for me to be living on my own. Um, yeah, I haven't really cooked myself just yet. I've been around people's houses, and I'm like, could you feed me? Um, but that's okay. That's okay. So let's get into the, to the uh, sermon. Um, in 2015, in Tesco's in Wrexham, uh, they posted a help wanted ad seeking a part-time worker with specific skills. Um, and it was called Christmas Light Untangler. Um, and the posting said that the supermarket was launching a new service, allowing customers to bring in their messy Christmas lights to be untangled. The ad called for candidates that could under, um, untangle 10 feet of Christmas lights in less than three minutes. 
as well as checking the bowls for signs of breakages. The posting also said that the ideal candidate for the 36 hour per week job will also be passionate about Christmas. Well, I don't know about you, but I could find it really hard to be passionate about Christmas while untangling Christmas lights. However, despite the troubles of life, you can enjoy the fullness of life no matter where you are. And if you have the Bibles, obviously, as we've just read, we're going to start at Colossians 1.15. And I'm doing it out of the ESV version. So I know that you guys have got NIV, but I'm going to do it <coughs> with the ESV. <coughs> And it states that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So if you're going to enjoy life, then at first you must acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of all creation. You must recognize that he's the creator God and that Jesus was first placed over all that he has made. The Bible is very clear here. Jesus is God. He is the image of the invisible God. And when you look at a penny coin, <clears throat> You see our Queen Elizabeth um, imprinted on that coin. And many of us have actually never met her in person. Many of you may have, have. But that image shows us what she may look like. Well, that's what it is when <clears throat> you look at Christ. He shows thank you. <laughs> to, I don't know what's happened. <coughs> um, he shows us what God looks like. He, he makes the invisible God visible. So in John 1.18, it says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made known. And Jesus himself said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. One of the early church fathers in the third century had an analogy. He told of a village with a huge statue, so immense that no one could see who it possibly represent. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Finally, someone um, <clears throat> miniaturized the statue so, so people could see it in, 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 and honor it by person. They said, this is what God does in his son. Christ is the self-miniaturized of God, the visible icon or the image of the invisible God, to use the language of Colossians 1.15. In other words, Jesus is the visible God showing us what the invisible God looks like. And as such, he has the first place in all creation. He is in charge of it all. That's what verse 15 says. It is the firstborn of all creation. This is not to say that Jesus was the first created in the sequence. No, rather Jesus is the first in status. The word firstborn speaks of a person's stature, status within the family, not the sequence of birth. It speaks of a primarily heir in the family, i.e., who's the one that leads the family. There are plenty of inc incidences in the Bible where the one who was born first did not become the primary heir and head of the family. For example, Abraham's son Ishmael was born first, but, but Isaac, has, who was his younger brother, became the primary heir. And then we've got <clears throat> Isaac's son Esau, who was born first, but Jacob, the younger brother, became the primary heir. And then Jacob's son Reuben was firstborn, but Joseph was the one who was in the family of the 12 children, became the primary heir. And I could go on with lots of different families in the Old Testament. Jesus is God. He is the Lord of creation because he himself has created it all. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. Jesus made everything there is, materially, immaterially, visible, invisible. He even made all the angels, the various powers, the authorities in the spiritual world. And Jesus is the first cause the instrumental cause and the final cause of all creation. Here's the origin, which means by it became into existence and its purpose. So everything was created by him, through him, and for him. Jesus is the creator God. In a children's book called Yellow and Pink, there are two wooden figurines like puppets. And uh, they wake up to find themselves lying on a, an old newspaper in the hot sun, and one of the figures is painted yellow and the other one's pink. Suddenly, yellow uh, sits up and asks, do you know why we're here? 
So the two figures became to debate the original of, uh, of their existence. And Pink surveys their well-formed features and concludes, someone must have made us. Yellow disagrees. I say we're an accident. And he outlines the hypothetical scenario of how it might have happened. A branch might have fallen off a tree, fallen on a sharp rock, splitting one and two of the branches into two legs. Then the wind might have been set up tumbling downhill until it was chipped and shaped. Perhaps a, perhaps a flash of lightning struck in a way and splintering the wood into arms and fingers. And eyes might have been formed by woodpeckers boring in the wood. With enough time, Yellow says, a thousand, a million, maybe two and a half million years, lots of unnatural and unusual things could have happened. But why not us? The two figures argued backwards and forwards. Then the, mum, the man came out of the nearby house, strolling over to the figures, and they picks them up and checks the paint. Ooh, nice and dry, he says. Tucks them under his arm, and he goes back towards the house. Peering out from one of the arms, Yellow speaks to whisper, sorry, Yellow whispers into Pink's ear, who's this guy? And I think their reaction might have been is when Jesus, our creator, shows up to judge our readiness for heaven. Who's this guy? They're all going to say, well, this guy happens to be our creator, not an accidental chance. Jesus is God as such. He is Lord of all. He is creator of all. And he sustains it all. And he holds it all together. Colossians 1.17, and he goes before all things and in him all things hold together. Well, the Bible tells us what the God particle is right here in, in Colossians 1.17. And only it's a particle. He is a person. Jesus holds everything together and he is not about to let it go or else it will just go flying apart. Though positively, charged protons in every atom would repel each other and life as we know it wouldn't actually see, cease to exist. Now, there is a coming a day when Jesus will let go of his creation. And in 2 Peter, it warns us that the day of the Lord will become like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be burned up. It's in 2 Peter 3.10. There will be a massive nuclear explosion as the protons in every atom go flying apart and destroying the whole of the entire universe. But until then... Jesus holds it together. By that, Jesus holds you, the one he created for himself. And that's what gives you life, meaning, and purpose if you choose to accept it. And if you want, to, if you want the fullness of life, despite the troubles of life, then first of all, acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of creation. And then second, acknowledge that Jesus is also Lord of the church. Recognize that Jesus has a place not over all creation, but also over all new creation, the body of believers that he is in a process of changing forever into his likenessness. Colossians 1.18, it goes on and says, And he is the head of the body of the church, i.e. he is the source and its leader. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in everything he might be permanent. There's that word again, firstborn. That does not mean that Jesus was the first one raised from the dead, because he wasn't, and we know that, because Jesus died and rose again. But he raised a widow's son from the dead in the town of Nain, and he also raised Lazarus from the dead. No, Jesus wasn't the firstborn raised from the dead. Rather, he is the Lord of all those who will be raised from the dead, the company of believers that make up his church. Christ is the source of the church. He is sovereign over the church, so he might be supreme over the church. You see, Jesus, sorry, uh, yeah, Jesus Christ is not content just ha having a part of your life. He's not impressed when you give him just one hour of week of worship or, you know, an hour a day of prayer or even a thought in your mind. Jesus doesn't want that small part. Let's say you give him a whole day of a week or maybe an hour or two every day. No, that's not what Jesus wants. Rather, Jesus wants the supreme. He wants all of you, every part of your life. When you go to work on a Monday morning, when you work for him, not your bosses or your clients, you're working for him. And when you take care of your family, you do it for him and not for them. And even when you have fun, he's the one you seek honor. 
Everything you do is all for his glory and for his pleasure. Jesus is Lord of the church. He is the Lord of every believer. And the sooner you recognize that, the better life will be. For example, in a football game, when you have an umpire um, who's made an outrageous call on the coach, and the coach is really angry, and it turns out the coach didn't agree with the umpire's decision um, or interpretation of a specific rule. So the game stopped as they engaged in a heated discussion. And finally, the umpire pulled out his rule book from his back pocket and proceeded to read page 27, paragraph 3b, section 1. And it says, as you can clearly see, the umpire, the rule means that they must call, my call must stand. But the coach was so unconvinced, he yelled at the umpire and said, but you're interpreting that rule incorrectly. To where the umpire replied, uh, excuse me, I should know, I wrote the rule book. After that awkward silence, the coach walked back to the bench, shook his head and pointed at the ref and told the team, Get hold of that guy. He wrote the rule book. You see, Jesus not only enforces the rules, he wrote the rules. And the sooner we accept that, the more fun we'll have by playing games called life. So quit arguing with the Lord, which only means you'll be stalling in your own life. Instead, just do what he says. You'll discover that life is have a falling and better purpose because of what he designed in us to be. Jesus is Lord of the church that it is, he is Lord of every believer because he reconciled every believer to himself. Through his death on the cross, he made it possible for everyone to be in the right relationship with God, who were all once enemies of God, can now be friends because Christ shed his blood for us. Colossians 1.19 goes on, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him the reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of Christ. Jesus, who is fully God, died on the cross for our sins so we can reconcile with him. Colossians 1, 21 to 22. And in you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and reapproach before him. The false teachers in Colossae were teaching the people that they could get closer to God through worshipping an angel, angel by obeying certain rules and regulations. But they never promised total and complete reconciliation. That's because no one can ever make themselves good enough for God. On the other hand, Christ can. Christ alone can totally and completely give reconciliation. Christ alone can turn enemies of God into those who are special to him, holy in his sight. Christ alone can turn sinners into those who are spotless or unblemished in God's sight. And Christ alone can turn guilty criminals into innocent citizens who are free of all charges. This isn't our work. This is the work work of Christ in us when you put the trust in him. My friends, they only know the only way they can find fullness of life, even in the trouble of life, is first, acknowledge that Christ is Lord of all creation. Secondly, acknowledge that Christ is Lord of his new church and new creation. Then, trust him to be your Lord. Trust him to have first place and, pl- and, and supreme uh, authorization over your life. And in all that whole Colossians 1, it says you experience a full and complete reconciliation. And going into 23, verse 23, if indeed you continue in faith, or more literally, since indeed you remain in the faith. There is no doubt here, our reconciliation with God is not a question of if. It is a sure thing because of what Christ has done for us. All we need to do is trust him with our lives. And the moment we do, he establishes us in faith. That what's rest of the verse goes on to say, In 23, it says, since indeed, you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in creation and in heaven, and of which I, Paul, became minister. The gospel is good news, right? Oh, come on, it's 20 past 11. 
Is the gospel good news? Yes, brilliant. The gospel is good news of what Christ did for you on the cross. And the moment you turn, trust Christ in your life, he firmly establishes you so that you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Uh, the town of Colossae was a region known for earthquakes, so these words were especially comforting to each and only one of those believers. Some of them had probably had their homes even moved from their foundations during many of the earthquakes. But here they learn that when they build their lives on the foundations of Christ himself, they're established on firm foundations. They are unwavering and they shall not be moved. So how about you? How about me? Where have we placed our trust? If your trust is in yourself, then you will, you will be moved and you'll be shaken every time the world is. But if you trust in Christ, then nothing, not even the greatest earthquake, can move the foundations of you that you've got in Christ. And it's really the only way to live. If you want to enjoy the fullness of life, even in the troubles of life, first, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of all creation. Second, acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of all his creation, i.e. everyone who believes in him. Then, trust him to be Lord of your life, each of you, individually. It's not enough to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of everybody. You must trust him to be your Lord. There is a father who carried a box of Christmas decorations down from a loft of their home. And they went to church, and putting up to the decorations, they had to wait until after church. So in the meantime, the five-year-old daughter, Lauren, was content in playing with this miniature plastic nativity set. When the father arrived home, the table was set for dinner with pieces of the nativity set at each uh, person's plate. Just then, Lauren raced into the kitchen and went, Oh, Daddy, Daddy! Her voice was really panicked. Jesus is missing! Oh, what are we going to do? We've looked everywhere. We can't find him. She was right. Her father didn't even see the baby Jesus anywhere on the table. We'll find him, he said. Sure that the baby Jesus was stuck under a couch or behind a cushion or behind a chair somewhere. Let's look after we eat. So they did. Low and high, high and low, under the couch, in the plant, in the Barbie playhouse. They scoured Lauren's colouring desk, cluttered with stickers and markers and crowns and half cans of juice. Everything but Jesus. Then the father looked into Lauren's backpack. Much like her older sister, Lauren carries her backpack everywhere she goes. And all her treasures are there. Her Harry bows, her hats, her Barbies, her stuffed kitty, her Polly Pocket, her plastic wallet, her gummy bears. So her father decided to look in her backpack. And there at the bottom of her backpack was Jesus ready to go with his daughter to preschool the next day. For me, that picture of that place is where Jesus wants to be. He's not content with just being put on display at a nativity set somewhere. He wants to be right there in the middle of it all, at the centre of all your interests and all your activities. He belongs in your car, in your bag, in your purse, even belongs in your office, your school, even in your checkbook. So put him there. And as we've just had Easter, don't give Jesus just a part of your life. Don't even give Jesus a prominent part of your life. Rather, give Jesus the place in all you do. Take him wherever you go. Amen. Thank you.